Hello and welcome to Random Walk, a sciencey podcast where we take mul- a sciencey podcast where we take multiple steps of unit length, each with directions selected independently and randomly compared to the previous step. I'm your host, Adam Fortas. Well, your random walk for the week. Actually, before we get to that, you might notice a little bit different uh, sound quality going on here. I am in the middle of a move, so I'm trying something a little bit different, a little bit more mobile. I've got myself a little hand recorder, and uh, yeah, so if you hear some environmental noise, it's a bonus? It's bonus. Yeah, so we've got a great show, uh, but first let's let's... Let's jump into our random walk for the week. Economics, stocks, stock prices. That's our random walk for the week. So one of the baseline level zero uh, economic theories of you know how stock prices should fluctuate uh, it effectively becomes a random walk. So here's how that works. Uh, a stock will have some you know intrinsic value. Uh, there's some rigorous definitions of what that means, but let's just say that most people agree that you know, a Scientific Canada stock has, you know, is worth $10. And that's going to be based on all of the available information out there. Uh, we're assuming there's no insider trading and that everything is just open access. So everybody has come to the conclusion $10 is fair. But some people probably aren't going to agree. They're going to come to slightly different conclusions. And so some people will, you know, buy a bunch at 10 thinking it'll go up. A bunch will be selling, thinking it'll go down. And... Um, basically, if all of the information is out there, and these are people making mistakes, there's no reason to believe that there should be more people buying than selling. So, effectively what you get is a just a random sort of fluctuation around the true value. So, think about our drunken walk from the previous episode. Uh, you know, you're at 10, say the, the bar's address is 10, and you're trying to get home, you step out the door and you have a 50-50 chance of, you know, going to 11 or going to 9. Now you're at one of those numbers, you're going to have another 50-50 chance. Since we don't know exactly what the intrinsic value is, that can fluctuate and it's based on, you know, various informations. Um, you know, wherever we are at that point, we're just going to assume it's a 50-50. And so you can get these wild uh, sort of tangents of prices, you know, moving in one direction. You can start at 10 and end up at 100. Uh, you could also end up at zero, but odds are you're probably going to end up at 10. So that's it for the week. Let's get to the content. So this week we're kind of talking risk and reward, probability, money, etc., etc. First, if you were a moth, how would you protect yourself from predators? Researchers from Bristol have recently discovered a built-in strategy that keeps some moths safe from echolocation-based attacks. Here, let me try let me try that one again. Researchers find new technique to survive the night. Bats hate it. Is that better? Video games, they can be hard, but maybe it's not your fault. Are cosmic rays making you lose? And for my favorite segment, Jesse D brings you the gamer's guide to ecology. We're going to finish off with Red Dead Redemption 2. Jesse D answers your questions. But first, this podcast is brought to you by scientificcanada.ca. The goal of Scientific Canada is to get real science to real people, which we do by producing entertaining and informative content about research, academia, and just being a curious nerd in general. A big part of our thing is finding and promoting new projects and new voices with financial support and expertise. If you have an idea for a project, we'd love to hear from you. Head to scientificcanada.ca to see some of the shows and articles we've helped with. And if you want to discuss details, you can find me on Twitter at Adam, F-O-R-T-A-I-S, or email me at F-O-R-T-A-I-S-A-D-A-M at gmail.com. Support for our projects comes from our generous and very, very smart Patreon subscribers. Find out more about how you can help us with our next projects over at patreon.com slash scican. Thanks. Hey there, welcome back. I'm Jesse D, a master's student in ecology and evolution and an open world RPG gamer. I just submitted my thesis for external review, which means I'll be defending it in a couple weeks. So pretty soon I'll have to change my intro. 
Today you're listening to episode 4 of Gamer's Guide to Ecology, where I play popular open-world RPGs from an ecological perspective. On today's episode, I answer your questions that you sent me about Red Dead Redemption 2 and or ecology in general. I'm wrapping up my playthroughs of RDR2 this week, but you can follow along with all my playthroughs at twitch.tv slash justjessyd on Thursday and Friday nights from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern. I had a couple great questions come in from friends and listeners over the last month, so let's dive right in. Question number one I got came from Twitter. What is carrying capacity, and how well does RDR2 model it? Carrying capacity is the number of individuals that an ecosystem can support or sustain. For small animals that don't take up a lot of space, that number can be high. For large animals that eat a lot, for example, that number can be small. It gets even more complicated when you imagine that different types of plants and animals are all sharing the same space. How many resources do they need to live year-round indefinitely? Things can get pretty out of balance if carrying capacity is exceeded and resources are depleted. RDR2 does a pretty good job of modeling carrying capacity, actually. I'm probably not going to find a bear every time I wander into the woods, but I'll definitely see a squirrel or a rabbit or a deer. At times, I find it's a few too many rabbits or deer, but in terms of the predator-to-prey ratio, I think it does a pretty good job. Question number two, what does endemic mean? Great question. Endemic means that a plant or animal is only found in a certain area. A good example of this in the game is the macaw. There are three types of macaw in RDR2, and all of them can be found exclusively in Guarma. This means that they're endemic to that island that you visit in the story and are found nowhere else. It can also mean that a plant or animal is native to a certain area, meaning that it is or was naturally found there. If an organism is no longer found in an area to which it is native, it's said to be extirpated. Remember the bison from episode 1? Humans hunted bison to such extremes in the 1800s that they were nearly wiped out. They were extirpated from large areas of land like Banff National Park that they were previously abundant on, meaning that there used to be a lot of them. Now, there are scientists and conservationists working closely with indigenous leaders to reestablish the population of bison in those areas. Go check out the Banff Bison Reintroduction Program at their Bison blog. I'll post the link in the episode notes. There are some really cool photos in it. Question 3. Why are there so many different types of squirrels, foxes, and sheep in this game? So you might have noticed that while playing the game, you come across what seems like different types of the same animal. Four types of foxes, maybe three types of squirrels, four types of sheep... Would it surprise you to know that these different types of the same animal aren't actually the same animal? They're actually different species? Now, there's quite some debate among biologists and ecologists as to what constitutes a species, but I won't go into the what is a species debate here. So let's just define a species as an organism that can only mate with others of its species. That is to say that species are reproductively isolated. This might happen a number of different ways. It could simply be because they live in different parts of the landscape, different parts of the world. It could be because they have specific vocalizations or behaviors that attract only mates of their same species. It could be that they're active at specific times of the day, like diurnal species that are active during the daytime and nocturnal species that are active during night. Some closely related species even share the same tree but hang out at different heights. On an even smaller scale, their gametes, which are their sperm and eggs, might be incompatible, or their DNA might combine into a sterile hybrid. These are all examples of ways that species are reproductively isolated. All of these related species may share a common ancestor, which is exactly what it sounds like. If the base of a tree is the common ancestor, its four branches are four different species. This common ancestor at some point in time went through the process of adaptive radiation, which is where many similar species evolved from it. A perfect example of this are the Galapagos finches. Google it. See how similar they look? They all have slightly different features that make them particularly suited to occupy a certain niche. So I guess the answer to your question about why are there so many different foxes is because the common ancestor to those four foxes diversified into them. This happens through a process called natural selection. Natural selection can be a disturbance event or an ongoing force. 
Animals with adaptations that do well under the disturbance survive and produce offspring, while those that don't die. Sometimes selection acts in a specific direction, like making beaks bigger. Sometimes it favors the mean, like making sure all the medium-sized beaks are similarly sized. Sometimes it acts in two opposite directions at once, like when birds with small or large beaks do well, but birds with medium-sized beaks don't. When disturbance and selection continue for hundreds of thousands of years, populations can change until they look or act differently enough that they're no longer able to mate with their ancestor. That's how you get species that might look like the same animal. That's evolution. That wraps up my four-part series on in-game ecology of Red Dead Redemption 2. For September, I'm diving under the waves to bring you in-game ecology of Subnautica. Thanks to you, my listeners, for tuning in today. It's been great hearing your feedback and questions. If you'd like to support the podcast, click the follow button on whichever platform you're listening today and download new episodes as they come out. Please follow my Twitch channel as well to help me hit affiliate. Come say hi and chat with me during streams at twitch.tv slash justjessied. That's J-U-S-T-J-E-S-S-I-E-D. Your support means that I can buy more open world RPG games and keep making episodes about in-game ecology. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to catch you next time. Podcast art is by Laura LeBlanc, and theme music is called Rain Song by Brett Eagleston. You can hear more of his music at bretteagleston.bandcamp.com. And now, a word from our sponsors. Well, I need a shave, but I don't know where to start. With all these 30-blade jaw shredders, it's just too complicated. Well, have you considered that the simplest shave could be the best shave? Yeah, With I was Occam's just going to... razor, all you need is one blade. You only have one face. Keep it parsimonious, stupid. Get your best shave with Occam's razor. Head over to scientificcanada.ca and enter code PARSIMONIOUS for your 10% discount. So, at the top of the show, we said we had some moth stories. Well, here we go. The search for improved stealth technology has led scientists and engineers in some pretty strange directions. And maybe that ends up being a fundamental part of what stealth is. Your hunting instincts develop in a way that lets you quickly identify your target so you can strike before it escapes. That is just one, you know, evolutionary idea of, of how we as hunters go about it. So it seems natural that, you know, one stealthy strategy would be the art of disguise. If you're being tracked by a ruthless and indiscriminate killer, though, maybe something like the Predator, a disguise isn't necessarily going to work. If they're just looking for anything to uh, to eat, then, you know, a disguise is not so hot. Maybe you try to hide and hope you go unnoticed. That might work. Or, if you want to take a more active and tricky Home Alone-style approach, maybe you make a decoy or diversion. That's what this story is about today. Some tricky diversions that moths have created. If hawkish birds of prey are built like fighter jets, then some of these moths maybe are built more like a B-2 stealth bomber. Some of these moths have, uh, you know, done away with what might be considered traditional aerodynamic designs for evasive function. Moths, not necessarily about speed. Uh, actually, some moths are loaded with technical features, kind of like an iPhone. And recently, Thomas R. Neal, Ella E. Kennedy, Brogan J. Harris, and Mark W. Holderreed at the University of Bristol have discovered one of these wing-based features, and it works like a decoy system. You wouldn't know it to see it, though. It's because this decoy system is there to trick sonar. So, if you're a bat, you might find your prey by screaming or clicking in the dark and chasing the echoes. Sound waves will reflect off of different materials in different ways, and bats can use this feedback to sort of map their surroundings. Because sound waves reflect differently off of different materials, bats can figure out the size, shape, 
and some of the material properties of their surroundings. But most importantly, they can very accurately hear where things are. So actually, quick diversion. I have two fun, now refuted scientific theories to share with you. This is one of my hobbies. I like uh, collecting old, debunked scientific theories. One, early theories of vision. We're talking like four to 500 BC. We're talking Plato, people like this. Uh, one of these early theories proposed that vision came from your eyes emitting some sort of beam that interacted with matter, letting you see. Kind of like echolocation in a sense, but I mean, very, very wrong. Based on this theory, it would kind of imply that you would be able to see in the dark. Uh, and so they had some ad hoc additions to it, like the sun has to also interact with various things. Yeah, it ended up not really panning out, but it stuck around for quite a while. And the second little bit here, and this one I'm not totally sure. Uh, I have some, some sources for the first one. This one I'm not sure where it came from, but it kind of makes sense, and I'd like to think that it's true. Uh, but take it with a grain of salt. But I think it used to be considered a mystery that how cave bats were able to swarm so densely and not smash into each other. I thought... I think I remember hearing that that was an active area of research for for a long time. Like, how do they do it? How do they not hit each other? How do their sonar and reflexes get to be so fast? Well, turns out they do just smash into each other. So, you know, they're, all, they're, not, they're not perfect. Okay, so where were we? Moths versus bats. So bats scream at things to figure out where they are, and if they find a tasty moth, they dart after it. So how do these moths create audio decoys? Well, first we need to know a little bit more about the moths this team was studying. These ones are huge, like top two biggest moths out there. This one, the one they were looking at is the Atticus Atlas moth, and if that doesn't sound like a huge name, I don't know what does. Uh, it calls the forests of Southeast Asia its home, and that's where it flexes its giant nine and a half inch coppery brown wingspan amongst the, you know, the trees, just flapping about. That's, it's huge. I'm looking at a picture right now and it's ginormous. Um, and one of the cool features it has, uh, at the tips of its wings, sort of on its shoulders, if you will, or maybe its hands, I don't know, stretch your arms out and the top bit. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Right in that spot, you got two interesting features, one on each side. Right at the, those tips are two interesting features. The first one actually begat its local Cantonese name, and I believe it roughly translates into something like snakehead moth. Uh, you should go check out a picture of this guy. Uh, if you can't find one on your own, head to scientificcanada.ca and uh, I'll have posted one. But they really do look like a snake's head, like side on, there's a little eye, it's kind of a smooth... Yeah, if you're not looking at it, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to really picture, but, uh, geez, it looks like a snake's head. The, the patterning and colors make it look like two snake's heads facing outwards on the moth's wings. But the other feature, the sonar busting feature, is harder to see. Turns out that at these little snake head areas, they have very small and delicate ruffles. And it's this ruffle that's critical to the moth's evasive success. So what the team from Bristol found was that this ruffle had some interesting audio reflection properties. It actually bounced back more sound than the rest of the body at almost any angle that you shouted at it. <laughs> it sounds kind of funny shouting at the moth to figures, but that's kind of what their experiment was. They, they held a moth still and fired sound waves of various frequencies at the moth, different parts of the moth, at various angles and looked at how the waves were reflected and returned to the source. Other less evasive moths, on the other hand, had dimmer wings and brighter bodies. So the trick is kind of twofold. They protect their head and body, the important bits, supposedly, by making the tips of their wings big, bright, and loud, so that, you know, a bat might go for those instead. Uh, they keep those parts far away from their juicy bodies with their huge wingspan, and if all goes well, this causes the predators to swing for what they think is a tasty torso and end up with a mouthful of wing dust. Pretty clever. So yeah, for, for links to the, the, the paper, which is pretty good, they, there's some nice pictures and uh, they do a good job of explaining it, 
Uh, and some pictures that I've collected of my own, including a model of how the, the very strange projected vision theory worked. It's kind of a cool picture. Um, you can head over to scientificcanada.ca. I'll have uh, the transcript here posted and, you know, all of the resources. Now, we're just sort of finishing up here. Originally, I wanted to cut in a bit of an interview I did with... Uh, so I have some friends who do a different video game podcast where they just talk gamer culture and various things. Um, and I really enjoy listening to it. It's called This Podcast Cannot Continue. Um, so I had them on to talk to me about a article that was forced into my newsfeed by Google. So I guess I've been listening to their podcast enough that uh, Google thinks that I might want to read more about video game things. Sure, why not? And I guess it cross-referenced my, my scientific inquiry to, uh, to give me this interesting headline. A rogue space particle could be responsible for this unsolved Super Mario 64 speedrun glitch. So I'll give you a little summary and I'll forward you on to our big, long, extended discussion about it. But the main idea is that some people were playing this video game, trying to complete it in the fastest time, and they do it in all sorts of ways, looking for little glitches that they can exploit, trying to, like, float through walls and various things, uh, just to get to the, to the end as quickly as possible. And during one of these events, um, a competitor floated through a wall in a very unexpected way. And this got everybody so excited because, this, you know, this could be a brand new technique that uh, could, could make you more competitive. So, a bounty was set. How did this guy do it? He did it by accident, but if they could reverse engineer how this glitch happened, then, you know, they might have a new little technique in their arsenal. Well, turns out they couldn't reproduce it. And it turns out that the only seemingly plausible explanation, a super high energy particle from space, may have interacted with one of the uh, delicate electronic components within the device. So head over to Patreon to listen to our discussion. I talk about the science aspect, like what a high energy particle would do to electronics, and why that actually seems plausible. And they talk a little bit about the culture of, you know, speedrunning and uh, reverse engineering these glitches. We also have on uh, one of our friends who is a computer scientist to talk about debugging and uh, how, you know, businesses and companies would go about doing that. And there's a, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of overlap. These people who do all of this volunteer voluntarily as just a hobby. You know what? By the end of the, the discussion, I was convinced that they're doing some pretty intense scientific inquiry there. So yeah, it's cool. You should check it out. Head over. So that's it for this episode. If you have comments or questions, you can find me on Twitter at Adam, F-O-R-T-A-I-S, or email me at FortisAdam at gmail.com. Thanks to the boys at This Podcast Cannot Continue, Colin and Ben. Thanks to Andrew. Actually, now that I think about it, all three of them are from the band Booney. And thanks, Booney, for letting me to letting me continue using your music. That's uh, that's the intro music and outro music that you hear. You can find more of their stuff at Booney.rocks. That's B-O-O-N-I-E dot R-O-C-K-S. If you like the show, share it with a friend. We are on all streaming platforms, YouTube. Just look for Scientific Canada anywhere you get podcasts. And if you want to learn more about us or want to help us support more creators, head to scientificcanada.ca. Thanks, and see you next week.
big in this phenomenon that happened to an airplane. Um, so from what I found in 2008, uh, a Qantas airline that was going from Singapore to Australia, um, it suddenly pitched down into a nosedive, and then the pilots had to take over and pull it back up. Twelve people were injured. Uh, as far as I read, nobody passed away or anything like that. Um, and what they called it, their like technical term, was it was a single event upset. Um, they couldn't find uh, any kind of like bug or programming error specifically in the system that could have caused it or whatever. And you know how airplanes have their log. I don't know. Is it a black box or uh, I, I don't know. Maybe that much aviation, so, yeah. but I know that like airplane computers log everything that happens to them. Right. And so they, you know, were able, I'm assuming to use that to reproduce all the steps in the airplane computer software and try to look for a bug. And apparently nothing was found. And, and again, so they called it a single event upset. Um, it does sound like it actually could be a possible cosmic ray type of situation in that case. Yeah, and it's interesting that it happened on a on a flight, and a flight particularly in that sort of area of the the world. So, like I was saying, that you know the magnetic field around Earth buffs away a lot of these cosmic rays. Yeah. Um, and like the further up into the atmosphere you get, um, oh, just yeah, fewer okay. and fewer particles and things for the cosmic ray to hit. So as as soon as the cosmic ray hits an atom, it's probably not going to go any further. It's going to put all of its energy into that thing, and it's going to do some weird reaction. Um, So this is actually a a known problem for uh, commercial airline pilots is they spend so much time high up in the atmosphere that uh, they take on way more cosmic ray radiation than somebody who lives further down in, in our atmosphere. That's interesting. And and the way that the magnetic uh, fields around earth are set up basically it's kind of like a, a weak spot on near the poles. <laughs> um, so it's even worse at buffing away uh, the cosmic radiation. 